Hello and welcome everyone to this colloquial talk by the Chair of Biopsychology and Neuroergonomics by Professor Grauman. And I am very, very happy to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Mike X. Cohen, who, uh, who is working in the Donders Institute and is uh, the author of many books or uh, particularly interested in the book Analyzing Neural Time Series Data, Theory and Practice which has guided me through many of my own uh, EG analysis. And um, there's also lots of MATLAB code available and so on. So I recommend check it out. And um, of course, there's not only methods development, um, but also fantastic research. For example, an ERC starting grant at the moment about midfrontal theta, costs and consequences, and uh, much, much more research as can of course be seen by lots of papers and citations. And to keep it brief, today's talk will be about system neuroscience and a little bit of a philosophical take on what we do with neural oscillations. And without further ado, I would give the floor to you, Mike. And thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. I'm the human talking. Not yeah, talking. And, and my dog is talking too. <laughs> okay, so yes, the stage is yours. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Marius and, and Klaus for the invitation. It's, uh, I, I wish I would be there in person uh, in Berlin, but um, uh, in lieu of being there in person, I thought I'd show you uh, what I would look like if I were standing in front of you. This is not quite how I dress every day because uh, I don't always wear these purple sunglasses, but you get the idea. I <laughs> um, guess the annoying thing about giving these talks online is that uh, you know I don't get the feedback from laughing. So I don't know if my jokes are like, really, really amazingly funny or really horrendously stupid. <laughs> so you'll have to suffer through them either way. Right, uh, so my um, story today comes in three parts. The first part is uh, you know ancient history, which is like before 2015 or so. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I'll talk about um, what we are currently doing. So this ancient history stuff, this is about, you know, what sort of, um, led up to what my group is working on uh, the past years at the Donners Institute. Uh, sorry, Mike, but uh, can you just share your screen? Um, oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> cool. Man, you guys missed the joke about seeing me. Let's see here. <laughs> you, we want this one. Yeah, sorry, I did a test before you guys all came in to make sure that my screen sharing was fine. Uh, so here we go. So now you can see uh, this is the picture that uh, you saw with the, and then uh, can I get rid of this? Yeah, I think that's good. All right. Right. Um, so uh, ancient history. <clears throat> um, everyone makes mistakes. We all make mistakes. People make mistakes. Animals make mistakes. Single-celled organisms make mistakes. When you go down to, you know, even the, the most fundamental lowest level of biology. There are mistakes that are just fundamentally written into the, the, the physics of life. Um, and in particular, you know, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for random mutations in uh, DNA sequences. So there's something very fundamental to biology about uh, mistakes and making mistakes. Um, so in, in my lab since, yeah, like over 15 years now, we've been kind of interested in understanding neural circuitry that underlies our ability to recognize that we're about to make a mistake and then correct ourselves uh, right before we do make that mistake. Um, and so, you know, the, the human stuff that, that we have been uh, working on relies a lot on these cognitive tasks that are kind of like the Stroop task. <laughs> um, so you're probably familiar with the Stroop task, but just in case uh, you're not. So the idea is that you are supposed to say this word as quickly as possible. So of course the word is blue, uh, but it's written in green font. So it, 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 can, it generates a bit of um, response conflict or competition between competing uh, responses, one of which is kind of automatic, but inappropriate, which in this case would be to say the word green. Um, and the other one is more goal-directed, which would be to say the word blue. Now it turns out we don't actually use the uh, Stroop task because there's a bunch of like linguistic overhead 
uh, and so on. So we use um, usually like Simon task and, and, and flankers task and so on, but, but uh, the, the details aren't really that important. So what we see is that if you look on trials where the, the subjects, the research participants actually didn't make a mistake. So it was a trial a condition where they, they could have made a mistake, but they actually made the correct response. We see this increase in the amplitude of this ongoing theta wobble. So it's around six Hertz um, and we can localize it to midfrontal um, uh, scalp areas. In particular, electrode FCZ seems to be about where it's uh, maximal. Now, of course, this is just you know one trial filtered at a particular frequency. So this is you know you don't you can't really uh, generalize too much about this. But um, when we run these analyses, uh, we scan you know all the frequencies. We look over the entire scalp, and we see that this conflict modulation is really you know, nicely localized in time and in frequency and also in space. So it, it's a real um, idiosyncratic signature of this feeling that you're about to make a mistake and then you catch yourself at the last moment and you, and you make the um, correct response. So again, these are all correct trials. We're not even looking at errors here. Now, there was, uh, you know, when we first start, we and other groups first started publishing this kind of stuff, uh, yeah, over 15 years ago, there was uh, a bit of um, resistance in literature. People, you know, the reviewers and, and people at conferences just weren't that, you know, they, they weren't very interested in it. They didn't know why we were doing this stuff. And uh, there was uh, some methodological pushback that maybe this isn't a real thing. It's just some weird artifact or it just reflects uh, a phasic um, ERP response. So. You know, we we spent like eight years and and probably like yeah maybe like forty publications uh, going through a lot of like really um, detailed meticulous methodological work to investigate this effect basically. Um, and uh, I, I'd be happy to talk for two hours about that, but uh, apparently I'm not supposed to let this talk go on for longer than four hours, so so I'll keep it fairly brief. But suffice it to say that. Uh, we, you know, we studied this, we characterized this, and we replicated it so often that, you know, we, we the the problem with publishing these kinds of findings sort of flipped. In the, in the beginning, there was resistance and criticism, and by the time we got to around 2012 or 2013, it started to get difficult to publish these papers because the reviewers were just bored with it, and uh, yeah, they just didn't want to see more replications and and different analysis methods of the same basic neural phenomenon. Um, and I, to be honest, I was also starting to get bored of, uh, of doing these. And I, you know, I, I had a little bit of a, of a, of a mental breakdown. I thought I, I can't just keep doing these EEG studies for the next 30 years of my life. So what is the, what is the important next thing to do? You know, wh wh what's the, the right direction to take midfrontal theta in? And I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of important directions uh, that we could take it. So looking at midfrontal theta and its relationship to other cognitive processes, like kind of response competition that you would experience during language processing, uh, sort of yeah, other aspects of motor processing, uh, memory processing, and so on. Um, relationship between frontal theta and and brain diseases, moving theta from uh, you know outside the safe confines of these um, you know kind of stupid computer-based tasks that we run in the lab to real-world behavior. Um, and these are important topics, and I'm, I'm happy that there are other groups that are taking this seriously and moving along these um, lines. But I actually decided that this is what I wanted to focus on, something about the underlying uh, physiology, um, underlying uh, midfrontal theta. And th the reason why I think this is important and why I decided to go in this direction is because you know, we get this EEG signal and it's this voltage wobble, right? It's this thing that's sort of bouncing up and down and it, it you know, it, it comes from the brain and it's meaningful. It's telling us something about, you know, how the brain works and what the brain is doing. In some sense, you know, the, the very existence of cognitive EEG and the success of cognitive electrophysiology is on its own kind of surprising in the sense that, you know, if you would read the Kendall book cover to cover, except for all the passages about EEG or MEG, you, you wouldn't guess that something like EEG would exist. You know, it, 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 so it just, 
it amazes me that, that we can get these cognitively relevant uh, traces from such an aggregated spatial scale. So that's already telling us something about uh, brain organization. But on the other hand, you know, cognition doesn't come from these wobbly lines right here, right? I mean, no, no one knows where cognition comes from. And anyone who tells you that they do know where it comes from is lying to you or they're lying to themselves. You know, nobody really knows where cognition comes from. But it, it's like fashionable in neuroscience these days to say that uh, neuroscience come, uh, or cognition comes from, you know, these complex interactions that are happening across different types of of cells distributed in different layers of the cortex across different fields of cortex and subcortex. And there's modulations by uh, neurochemicals and so on. So I, I don't know if that's really where cognition comes from, but, uh, but you know, we can assume for the moment that it's these circuits that are producing uh, or allowing for um, cognition and, and behavior and so on. And these circuits are also simultaneously producing these electrical fields that are aggregate enough to measure from outside the head from EEG. So the question is, you know, can we can we do inverse inference? Basically, can we understand something about this neural circuitry based on what we can record from this EEG signal here? Um, and uh, yeah, so that that's kind of. Uh, where I want it to go. So in other words, you know, what can we say about what's happening at the circuit level based on the phenomena that we can observe non-invasively at the, the level of the scalp or the skull? So uh, yeah, so that's sort of the um, direction I wanted to go to. And then this was about like 2014 or so, and I wrote a couple of grant proposals and I was fortunate to get two of them, an ERC uh, starting grant and an Ipasia Fellowship, which is at the Rabat UMC, which is where the um, Donners Institute is. So I moved, I was uh, at this time in ancient history, I was at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and then I moved to the Donners Institute and uh, that gets us to the modern era. And the modern era is separated into the messy parts and, and the, the clean, pure parts. So you'll see by the time I get to part three, you'll see why those are the pure parts and this is the messy stuff. So. Uh, basically, the, the goal of my lab and, and our research in the past four years or so is to um, understand the biological origin of midfrontal theta by measuring EEG while manipulating and also measuring uh, microcircuit components. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, this is stuff that uh, requires animal models. Now, needless to say, we have utterly failed to uh, understand the biological origin of midfrontal theta. Uh, that could be, you know, because I and everyone in my lab is a complete failure, but I think there's an alternative hypothesis, which is that um, this question is, you know, it's, it's easy for me to just, you know, write this text and, and on the slide and, and say it out loud, but it's, it's a really fucking hard question. You know, it's, it's hard empirically, uh, it's hard technically, it's hard um, analytically, it's hard theoretically, it's just really difficult to try to um, link mechanisms across these these different spatial scales and different species as well but um anyway you know if, if science were easy it wouldn't be worth doing so uh, so but this is basically the uh the, the goal of my group now at the at the donders um so yeah so we started in uh 2016 basically building up the lab from scratch so here you see we're constructing uh the lab this is our first um, pilot experiment. And uh, yeah, obviously this is like pre-corona times. And here it seems weird to have so many people in such a tiny space without masks. But um, yeah, but this was, uh, so it was like, yeah, PhD students and postdocs and technicians. The lab isn't always this crowded, of course, but we happen to be doing some construction, calibration, and piloting all at the same time. So most of us were in the lab. Um, so I just want to show a couple of pictures um, of, uh, well, I guess I can say, yeah, so, so the idea is that we are doing um, experiments in, in, uh, in, in rodents, in mice and rats. And the idea is that we implant um, a lot of very small electrodes into multiple brain regions. And we also do electrical stimulation, um, optogenetic stimulation, uh, and, and, and also some uh, behavioral tasks as well. So I'm going to show you 
uh, just a, a couple of pictures to give you a sense of like the kinds of electrodes that we have designed that we are using. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of data, although most of the data isn't published yet because uh, um, well, you'll see why it, it gets pretty complicated. Um, so uh, yeah, here's an example of uh, an electrode that we custom designed. It's, it has four probes like this and um, it goes into the, the medial frontal cortex of a, of a rat. So you see there's four prongs here and there's um, 64 electrodes in total. So we can measure from multiple fields as well as uh, deep and superficial layers of the cortex. Um, here's another uh, example of an electrode that we put into the uh, VTA and al also the SNC. So this picture isn't totally uh, accurate, but we, we sample the VTA and the SNC. And that's, uh, yeah, to look at um, population activity in the uh, dopamine system and see how that relates to um, cortical striatal synchronization. Um, sometimes we also build our own electrodes. So here you see an example of a custom-made electrode that we build in my lab. It's actually uh, 32. So there's, there's, you know, you see, it looks like there's eight prongs here, uh, but there's three rows and they're just uh, perfectly aligned. And these electrodes are nice because we can custom design them for uh, like curvature in, in the cortex and things like that. Um, so I, I want to tell you a, a little bit about uh, a couple of the projects that we are working on. One is looking at phasic dopamine and um, synchronization, in particular cortical striatal synchronization, which um, as I'm sure you know, is is uh, is sort of richly, deeply implicated in all sorts of um, cognitive and emotional um, uh, computations. So uh, let's see. So the idea is we have these uh, TH Cree uh, rats. So that allows us to um, to optogenetically target the uh, the specific dopamine cells that either. Um, uh, synapse onto the striatum or that synapse uh, up into the PSC. So, uh, so we can basically up and down regulate the uh, dopaminergic input into the striatum or into the PFC while recording from simultaneously from the PFC, the striatum, and the VTA. Um, and then, uh, yes, yeah, so some of the experiments we do uh, are um, involve delivering trains of stimulation. So, if you see an example, we are stimulating the VTA at uh, 12 hertz for around two seconds. And this is a little bit of, of the data. Um, yeah, so here you see some, so, so we get some nice expression in the VTA and in the SNC. These are all the neurons that, uh, that positively express uh, channel rhodopsin. So these are the cells that, um, that, that are yeah, dopaminergic and that project to the prefrontal cortex. And these are the ones that we are stimulating. Uh, so here's, uh, an example of the kind of data that we are getting and the kind of results that we are getting. Um, so in this case, time zero is uh, the onset of the, uh, of the uh, laser stimulation. And here we're stimulating the VTA at four hertz. So rhythmically at four hertz for two seconds. But the data that you're looking at here, this is the response of the prefrontal cortex to the VTA uh, stimulation. And a couple of interesting things to note, you know, one is that the PSC response starts around half a second after the stimulation has already begun. So it, it seems like, you know, the, the, the PSC needs to like spin up for a couple of cycles uh, before we really see a strong modulation. It's also pretty interesting that uh, the, uh, the stimulation is at four hertz, but the PSC is actually responding at uh, this, this peak here is nine hertz. And then we see at multiple uh, harmonic frequencies, so 18 hertz and so on. So we're not getting a uh, response in the cortex that is trivially driven by uh, the, the, the light stimulation itself. It's, it's that, you know, we drive the dopamine system at some frequency and uh, that's causing the PFC to respond at its own intrinsic uh, frequency, which in this case happens to be nine hertz. So this is just uh, one example. Um, and here you see yeah, a couple of other examples. So as I mentioned, we record in the, in the PFC and in the striatum. Uh, so it's, a, it's a lot of data. Uh, yeah, we, we try to do these simple experiments. They end up getting really complicated really quickly. Um, this is uh, one of my PhD students' dissertations, basically, is uh, working on uh, this project. That is uh, not a response, this guy here. Um, Paul is a postdoc who's also working on this project. <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, so then, uh, so, so we're looking at local dynamics in PFC and stratum, and of course, synchronization between the PFC and the stratum that is modulated by or induced by the dopamine stimulation coming from the VTA. So just to give you a bit of a sense of um, one of the projects. Oh, I forgot to mention, but we also measure um, EEG. We have uh, four or five channels of EEG on these animals at the same time. Um, so we are also doing uh, a couple of projects in mice. Um, and mice give us a bit more um, genetic uh, opportunities to, um, to investigate some detail of uh, the neural circuitry in the prefrontal cortex. Um, so, for example, we can use a dual virus injection to um, up or down regulate the uh, cortical cortical um, interactions, so cortical um, long range cortical inputs into the prefrontal cortex. And simultaneously, we can modulate the local um, interneuron uh, activity within the prefrontal cortex. So, this is nice because that allows us to, yeah, basically control both the long range inputs and the local aspects of the neural circuitry. Um, and of course, yeah, we, we record from the PFC and parietal cortex um, at the same time. Uh, also a really nice uh, expression here. These are the, the long range inputs from parietal cortex into the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, let's see, so just to again, give you a little bit of a, a sense of what these data uh, look like. This was from our, uh, some, from some early pilot recordings. So here we, uh, stimulate the excitatory inputs from parietal cortex into the prefrontal cortex. And uh, it's a phasic stimulation, but it drives a lasting um, theta response in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and then we, we can repeat that experiment while um, silencing the somatostatin cells locally in the prefrontal cortex. And that also blocks the theta. So it's pretty neat that that gives us some indication of the, uh, the kinds of yeah, sort of neural um, dynamics that are uh, that are sufficient for generating uh, and and also blocking uh, or cessating uh, um, local theta in the prefrontal cortex. <clears throat> so yeah, you know we were super excited by uh, by these data, of course. And then yeah, as we started to collect uh, more and more data, the, the picture just started looking a lot more complicated. And you know, it's another one of these knowing things in, in science where you try to do a really simple experiment and you think that the results are gonna be really straightforward and easy to interpret. And it turns out that that's just not how the brain works. The brain doesn't work like this really simple um, you know, input output uh, response box. Um, so, so we're still you know, kind of struggling with, with working through the data. I guess the, you know, the, the issue that we see with these kinds of data um, and right now, you know, I can just tell you my, my feeling about it from, from working with these data uh, is, is that, um, you know, individual data sets look very nice and clean and compelling and really interesting. And then we look across different data sets and the, the patterns are changing on different days and, and in different animals. So it's, they are kind of struggling uh, with, with how exactly to, um, to quantify that, that, uh, that diversity. Um, but that's sort of, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, I also don't like the idea of, you know, sort of smudging the, the data until everything looks really clean and crisp. I think, you know, if we do straightforward experiments and we have good data and the results are messy and difficult, then that's telling us that the brain is messy and difficult. And I think that it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's frustrating and it's, it's practically difficult, but I think that's closer to the truth than, uh, than oversimplifying things. Anyway, um, so that's some of our uh, experiments involving optogenetic uh, manipulations. Um, I'm gonna tell you now a little bit about uh, some behavioral stuff. So this is like a, a Skinner box that we built. So the animal would be in here. And then, um, yeah, there's uh, like these are, are nose pokes. The animal can make responses, and then there's LEDs and uh, and 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 little speakers in here, and there's um, solenoid pumps for delivering water rewards and so on. So we can do um, tasks that are you know similar to uh, cognitive control tasks that are done in um, in humans. Um, and this is getting back to uh, back to the issue of of theta. So. What we're trying to do in this project is un, is is characterize a little bit of the um, the 
the, the circuitry uh, of midfrontal theta during these tasks using these animals. So uh, with um, invasive recording. So, you know, one question we can ask is how many thetas are there? And there's been this assumption in the midfrontal theta conflict um, theta literature that midfrontal theta is this kind of, you know, unitary, you know, unidimensional thing. So there, there's like the conflict related midfrontal theta in the brain. And it's like, you know, one little dipole somewhere in the medial prefrontal cortex. And, uh, you know, that when it, the more it activates, the more conflict there, you know, is happening, is, is being experienced. And that's, um, that's been a reasonable conclusion based on the way that people have traditionally analyzed data. And uh, I have also made this uh, assumption very explicit in, in papers, like in a, a review paper in TINS in 2014. I, I wrote exactly this, that it, you know, I think it's, it's unidimensional. So obviously I, I was wrong. Uh, because everyone is wrong in, in science, or at least, you know, most people are in science. Very, very few people actually get it right. So um, so we wanted to take this opportunity to try and, and look for this. So we implanted uh, an array of electrodes into the prefrontal cortex, which from the different views look looks like this. So the top view, you know, just looks like this uh, 10, 10 by 3 grid, um, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because each each of these layers has a different, um, uh, you know, Y and, and Z uh, coordinate. But anyway, so so we've recorded these animals while they were doing this kind of like a basically like a, a, a rodent model of a, a Simon task, which is a conflict task. Um, so this is work that was started by postdoc uh, deals and, and uh, Jordi, who was a master student and always a PhD student lab also helped out and a, a lot of the data analysis was done by Mara as part of her um, dissertation. So what you see here is a um, spectrum, uh, a power spectrum, but it's not exactly a, a power spectrum that's coming from a Fourier transform. It's coming from a multivariate power ratio uh, where we're trying to find um, combinations of these channels, so linear weighted combinations of these channels that um, separates each narrow band frequency from the broadband one over f spectrum. So when you see one, that means that you know there's basically nothing happening at that frequency. So you can you can still interpret it basically like a, a power spectrum. And each of these dots here shows a significant component. So a, a component like a, a weighted combination of channels. I'll talk more about this in a few minutes. But you can think of it like you know PCA ICA kind of thing. So um, each of these dots shows a, a, a unique weighted combination of channels that gives a distinct and linearly separable uh, network at that particular frequency. So basically this whole configuration of dots here is telling us that there are multiple statistically independent networks that are operating at exactly the same frequency and they're distributed across these 30 different channels. So this is from one animal and from another animal. And you see we get some nice concentration of, of lots of individual, like independent uh, neural circuits um, in, yeah, I don't know if you want to call this high delta or low theta. And this is kind of the, the um, this would be a little bit high for human theta, but it's, it's right in the range of like traditional rodent uh, cortical theta. Um, and then of course at high frequencies as well. Um, so now, not, not th these are the um, all the the components that are task related. Not all of them are conflict related. So we look at the ones that are conflict related. That's a smaller subset of all of these, and then we can cluster them into uh, a smaller number of clusters. These are their time frequency um, analyses. So you can see that we do get some theta um, in uh, in individual animals. This is just from each from uh, one animal. Um, and uh, also some conflict modulation in theta. You can see it's not nearly as beautiful as the ones I showed in, in humans. Partly that's because you know the human data is averaged over twenty to thirty subjects, and and you know this is individual animals. Um, to be honest, I, I think it's also partly because I'm, I'm no longer convinced that rodents are a really a good model for studying frontal theta and and human cognitive control, which is something we can, you know, we, we can talk about later if you want, but 
uh, but we do see some nice uh, some nice uh, conflict modulations in theta. And these are what the topographies look like. So this would be you know looking looking down on the top of the head uh, at like this kind of a, a view. So basically, yeah, each component and therefore the cluster of components is a is a weighted combination of channels. So you, you get a bit of the topography. So uh, so there's more stuff to do here uh, in in the rats, for example, linking these uh, components to spikes and so on. But um, yeah, but Marit uh, and I found this quite remarkable that we get all of these theta components, many of which are modulated by conflict, but in uh, in sort of seemingly you know kind of grossly similar ways although they are they are linearly separable components so we thought you know maybe this is going on in humans too and we've just never been looking at the data in the right way so so we've been missing it this whole time so we went back to an older data set uh, that i had this is a data set that that i collected at um in san francisco at ucsf uh, uh, quite a few years ago. It's a data set with combined MEG and EEG. So we have like 275, I think, MEG sensors and, um, and, uh, and, and 50 EEG electrodes all recorded at the same time. So you see that reflected in the covariance matrix. This is the EEG covariance, this is the MEG covariance, and then the, the, the off diagonals here are the um, EEG to MEG uh, covariances. So I'm going to talk uh, in a few moments a little bit more about um, how we do these analyses. But essentially, we we get a, a, a theta band filtered covariance matrix and a broadband covariance matrix. Then we implement something called generalized eigenvalue composition, uh, which is um, yeah, it's a multivariate procedure that basically identifies patterns in the data, features in the data space, or vectors in the data space that maximally separate uh the the you know this covariance matrix from this covariance matrix and this is basically our way of finding these linearly separable uh components in the data so here you see an example of one component this is the eeg topography the meg topography of course these are recorded simultaneously so these are for this one particular individual these are all the theta uh components this is a, a statistical significance that's corrected for multiple comparisons over you know, 320 and, and, and or whatever uh, uh, comparisons that we have here. Um, so you see there's a ton of theta components. Now, not all of these are frontal theta and not all of these are conflict modulation. Uh, but when we when we look to see which of, um, which of the components that we get, uh, the theta components are um, mid-frontal, according to an EEG template, and um, also significantly modulated by conflict in this, uh, in this um, Simon task. And we see it's, it's more than one, first of all, uh, and it, it varies over subjects. So the, the subject with the fewest components had three, and I guess 11 is uh, the most, but you can see, you know, it's somewhere in, in the, the range of like, you know, around five-ish, we can say on, on average components. So these are, um, mid frontal. I wonder if I have. Uh, I don't have the uh, time frequency mass, but so these are um, components that are defined by being EEG mid frontal. Though we we didn't restrict the MEG, so those topographies were were uh, open to to uh, being driven by the data, and also significantly modulated by conflict. And because of the eigenvalue composition, these are all uh, linearly independent. So these are separate components. That are all happening at the same time. So the the picture that you know this is starting to paint is that when you when we first get the data, the data come in a 328 dimensional uh, space because we have 328 uh, sensors, and then we we identify this this um, theta subspace, uh, which is a much smaller dimensional subspace, and then the conflict modulation within that subspace is happening along some of the vectors, so not even all of the the vectors, but there is this, you know, greater than one dimensional subspace in the prefrontal cortex that is uh, responding to conflict by modulating amplitude in the theta band. And uh, yeah, so that, that first of all proves me wrong and uh, a, a lot of other people. And, and I think it, you know, shows that that um, we need to kind of rethink the, the, the complexity of, of what's happening 
there. And it's not clear from, from this study what these different um, basis vector, you know, what, what these different dimensions in this subspace actually correspond to. Um, you know, it could be that they are, um, you know, like the uh, different, you know, for, for example, you know, the, these would be like um, different cognitive uh, dimensions of the task. And this subject was using, so, you know, in some sort of abstract way, three dimensions of cognition to, um, to, to solve the conflict task. And this one was doing it in six dimensions. It's also possible that, you know, cognitively, it's like, it's still one process at a cognitive level, but it's implemented as coordination across multiple distinct networks that are oscillating at the same frequency and have similar time uh, time series, but um, but but are are still independent of each other, statistically independent of each other. So we're we're still struggling to figure out you know what what this all means, but um, uh, but certainly this is what the what the data are are telling us. Yeah. So. Uh, so, so with that, I'm going to move on to like the, the the pure, clean parts of of the modern era, which is the more methodsy stuff that I, I want to um, tell you about. And uh, yeah, because I, I guess there's you know sort of in my professional life, there's like three things that I do. There's the um, the the empirical stuff, which is basically everything I've been discussing so far. There's the um, educational stuff, and that's like my books and YouTube videos and teaching and things. And then there's the methods development uh, stuff, which strongly influence how I think uh, about the empirical stuff. And, uh, and of course, it also influences what I, um, uh, what I think I should teach about. So that's, that's like the pure parts, because we can work with simulated data and equations, we don't have to worry about messy biology, which is like really hard to understand and, and pretty frustrating to work with. Um, yeah, so getting back to, to this picture, of course, we measure the brain through uh, electrodes. Uh, but, you know, there, there isn't a one to one correspondence between an electrode and a, and a source. And, and by source, you know, not just referring to a dipole, I mean, the thing that we are interested in understanding, which is uh, some, some kind of a, a computation, some atom of, of cognition. And, and these you know, fundamental elements of, of cognition are presumably distributed over space, and they're also distributed over multiple spatial scales. And so measuring from one electrode, you know, it's not it's not feasible. I think it's it's not plausible to say that you know one electrode corresponds to one source. Now that's easy to say at the level of EEG because of volume conduction and so on. But I think that the, it's exactly the same story when you get down to the lower level. Even if, if you have you know micro wires like a, a silicon probe or uh, tungsten wires in, implanted, you're you're closer, you know, the, the level of spatial granularity is of course much higher, but that doesn't mean that you're still that doesn't mean that a single electrode corresponds to a source in the sense of, you know, the, the thing that we, the level of, of neural circuitry that we want to understand. So the computations that are taking place in the brain are still distributed across many different electrodes, regardless of the spatial scale that you're measuring. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so let's assume that neural computations are distributed um, spatially and they're and they're coordinated, um, and they also span multiple spatial scales, so from uh, microns up to centimeters. And because you know I work with electrophysiology, uh, the, uh, electrical fields also spread through volume conduction, and importantly, they sum linearly. That's a that's a crucial part. Um, this volume conduction basically means that um, the same pocket of neurons, same circuit, can project to multiple electrodes, which is actually not um, uh, it's it's not something that we should it's something that we should be thankful to the universe for because neuroscience would be much harder if uh, we didn't have volume conduction. So if you make these two assumptions, if you buy these two assumptions, then uh, basically a one-to-one -one mapping between electrode and you know, computation is not physiologically plausible. Uh, instead, the data patterns are distributed over electrodes. I don't think that's a terribly contentious uh, view. Um, and I think it also means that multivariate data analyses 
are more physiologically interpretable and can reveal findings that are kind of hidden in the univariate uh, data, that is when just looking at um, individual electrodes at a time. I use hidden in apology quotes here because, you know, these, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll get back to that in, in a moment, but basically, you know, we're, we're not like making up stuff in the data. We're just pushing around the, the, the data so we can isolate and boost the signal to noise of, of patterns that are in the data, but might be difficult to spot when, when just looking at a single electrode. All of this, you know, this, this, um, univariate approach in neuroscience reminds me of uh, this cartoon, which is fable, I guess, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but it's, you know, a bunch of blinded scientists that are all touching a different part of an elephant and they all make different conclusions. The thing is not, none of these guys is really wrong based on the data that they have available to them. But uh, of course, they're, you know, they're, they're kind of missing the bigger picture here because, uh, yeah, because they, they're only measuring a, a tiny piece of it. So it's a little bit extreme. Uh, I don't think it's wrong to do univariate analyses, but I do think that we are potentially missing a lot of findings uh, and, and features that are in the data that we just have a difficult time um, accessing and, and seeing without doing some kind of uh, more sophisticated analysis approach. Um, and so basically it's all about uh, filtering. And for a variety of reasons, uh, I think that um, uh, linear filtering is the best. So there's temporal filtering, which is like, yeah, filtering and, and uh, time frequency analyses and spectral analyses and spatial filtering, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But in my mind, these are all exactly the same thing. Essentially, when you filter the data, you're trying to do source separation. And this just means taking the raw signal, whether it's raw over time or raw over space, and designing uh, kernels uh, uh, that act as weights, such that the weighted sum of the data over time or over space allows you to um, focus on some specific feature in the data while suppressing other features in the data. So with temporal filtering, it's all about, you know, suppressing uh, a broadband signal, uh, you know, free uh, energy at different frequencies. And with spatial filtering, there are, yeah, different space, um, filtering techniques that, that will optimize for different characteristics of the data. But, um, but it's always just, you know, linear combinations. And the idea is that the linear combination is, is, is picking out something that's in the data that's distributed over the electrodes. And when you're looking at a single electrode, you get multiple patterns that are mixed and with reduced SNR. Uh, so how does all this work? Well, I, I'm a big fan of um, covariance-based spatial filters. Uh, covariance matrices are, are brilliant. I mean, they look really nice, first of all, but um, they also pack a lot of punch. So that there's a lot of information that's embedded in a covariance matrix um, in, a, in a compact form. So covariance matrix basically encodes all of the pairwise linear interactions across all the pairs of channels. <clears throat> um, and also a neat thing about the uh, covariance matrix is that it has the same column space. So it lives in the same data space. So any, anything you can infer based on the covariance matrix, you can also apply to the original data. So that, that's a pretty powerful uh, transformation. So um, there, there's lots of different kinds of uh, spatial filters. And I'm sure you're all familiar with like ICA and, and PCA. Um, I have become over the, the years a huge fan of something called generalized eigen decomposition. Um, and it's, you know, if you would cross out this matrix here, then this is like, this is basically a PCA where you do an eigen decomposition on one covariance matrix. The idea of generalized eigen decomposition is that you have two covariance matrices. One is a reference and one is signal. And so what these eigenvectors are going to identify is the features in the data that separate this matrix from this matrix. And the way to think about that, uh, or one way to think about that is it's, it's analogous to a division. So it's like you are computing a ratio of this covariance matrix to this covariance matrix. And the eigenvectors are gonna tell you how to combine all the channels to maximize that ratio, which means best separate this matrix from this matrix. Um, and uh, so this is like a really generic mathematical framework. 
uh, that's that's really widely applicable in many analyses. It's it's used a lot in uh, in BCI, for example, in, in brain computer interfaces. It's also the mathematical backbone of um, uh, Fisher linear discriminant analysis. And basically, any kind of uh, uh, or almost any linear classifier is is based on uh, generalized eigenvalue composition. Um, we also find that uh, this method, generalized eigenvalue composition, because uh, you know, because any of the features that are in both of these uh, covariance matrices get suppressed, it's therefore much more sensitive to um, to uncovering something, uh, some specific optimization compared to ICA or PCA, and th that you can see here. So, there the reconstruction. This is in simulated data, so we we know what the ground truth is. So, the reconstruction accuracy for generalized agony composition is much higher, uh, well, significantly higher than for ICA particularly at low SNR values. And this is a, a different study. Here we find actually ICA does a pretty crappy job. PCA does a little bit better, but mostly the generalized eigenvalue composition does really well. And again, that's because we are leveraging uh, these two covariance matrices to really isolate uh, specific features of, um, of uh, data. One of the things that's been remarkable to me is, is how successful this method is and, and, and how easy it is to adapt to different uh, situations. So here we tried uh, the same method in uh, monkey amygdala data. So these are um, multi-channel, so 16-channel uh, probes that were implanted into the amygdala. And the remarkable thing is that, or one of several remarkable things about this study was that um, the components actually uh, rediscovered the anatomy so the probes, you know, are, can be implanted on, on different recording sessions into different uh, or across different nuclei in the amygdala, and uh, the eigenvalue composition just just perfectly reconstructed the anatomical mapping. Uh, and you know, the the, the there's no uh, anatomy or spatial information that's constrained or provided uh, in the analysis. So in fact, we could we could randomly shuffle the ordering of the channels, and it, it doesn't change this result. So somehow, you know, this this is able to um, to extract all these uh, um, uh, pretty granular details of, of anatomical subdivisions of the primate amygdala. Um, we've also had a lot of success uh, with this method, applying it to cross frequency coupling, where we can um, isolate in the R and S matrices these different covariance matrices, uh, different features that we, based on theoretical motivations, think are. Uh, related to cross-frequency coupling, like the uh, the, the covariance during a, a trough of an ongoing theta oscillation, for example. Um, this is uh, an application in uh, that that we're sort of currently uh, working on in the lab. These are uh, from uh, three region simultaneous recordings in the mouse. So we have uh, recordings in the prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex and the hippocampus, and we get the LFP and the spikes. So this is the LFP. Uh, from each of these regions. These are all the individual uh, neuron time series. It's smoothed, which is why it looks smooth. <laughs> uh, and then it's it's also, yeah, all the data are sort of suitably normalized. So all the channels have the same normalization. And then, you know, we just, it's so it's spanning multiple brain regions and multiple uh, spatial scales. And we just chuck everything into the, the same covariance matrix and run the decomposition totally blind to the origin of the, the data, so the spatial scale of each data channel. And again, we, we find that in different frequency ranges, we get multiple linearly separable components. So there's you know multiple distinct um, circuits in the brain that are oscillating at the same frequency, but have a different spatial topography and also a different time course. So of course, linking this stuff to like cognition and behavior and, and function is is quite a you know a nightmare. But um, but this is really you know the I think getting us closer to the level of complexity of uh, of of the of the brain in vivo. Um, I do want to spend uh, a couple minutes on on this paper uh, on this method uh, because I'm pretty excited about this one. This was a sort of almost a, a chance um, finding that, that I just kind of stumbled over, but it, it turned out to be pretty um, pretty remarkable. So uh, this has to do with, um, with uh, defining frequency boundaries. Now, of course, the fact that we do have these 
um, labels for frequency bands like delta, theta, alpha, and beta, and so on. It's meaningful, right? The, those labels aren't, aren't, aren't uh, meaningless. But on the other hand, the, the exact boundaries between the different bands is kind of arbitrary and confusing and a little weird, right? So, you know, first of all, why do frequency boundaries have exact integers, <laughs> integer boundaries? You know, I, I don't think nature would have would have necessitated that. And some people will call alpha uh, 8 to 12 hertz, or uh, other people call it 8 to 13 hertz, or 7 to 12 hertz, and, and so on. So there's a little bit of um, subjectivity in, in the, the boundaries there. So the idea um, here is, again, you know, generalized eigenvalue composition, the same sort of fundamental skeleton uh, that we adapted um, to, to isolating different frequencies and, and defining boundaries for frequencies purely based on empirical um, considerations. So the idea is that, you know, a frequency band should be uh, not only, you know, it should be spectrally uh, related and narrow, uh, but we assume that a, a frequency band should also have similar temporal, or I, I should, let me rephrase that. So all of the like very narrow frequencies within a band, a meaningful neurophysiological band, should have similar um, topographies and similar uh, time courses in addition to having similar spectral profiles. So that's the idea here. So what you're looking at here is a, a correlation uh, matrix of the, the um, eigenvectors from this generalized eigen composition across lots of different frequencies. And it's pretty amazing that, um, uh, you know, you get this kind of block diagonal um, organization and you can apply uh, some clustering. So we did a DB scan um, clustering and then basically it's telling us that, you know, this is an empirical frequency band and I, I'm not imposing these upper and lower bounds here. This is just coming out of the, out of the data. So um, here you see simulated data. Of course, everything looks great in simulated data. It's not so hard, but this is the ground truth uh, topography maps. These are the, the, the filtered maps. So these are the, the projections of the filter, uh, which is usually what you interpret anatomically. Uh, topographically, but you can also look at the eigenvectors themselves. The eigenvectors, um, you know, have to basically invert these maps to undo the effect of volume conduction. So the eigenvectors are effectively high-pass uh, spatial filters. So you can see that, you know, these two, um, these two like neighboring alpha components are strongly correlated in space the way that I created them, but in the eigenvector space, they're they're basically orthogonal, and you know they're not. This analysis is not a principal components analysis, so the eigenvectors are not constrained to be orthogonal. But because of the, you know, you have these sparse vectors in a high-dimensional space, so they end up basically being orthogonal. So that allows for this really clean separation. Even though when you look at the power spectrum, you see that there isn't actually a a clean separation here. And in fact, you know, if if I would have smoothed this a little bit more this would just look like one alpha peak, you know, and then you would average these two together. And like I said before, I, I don't think that's necessarily wrong, but, um, but I, I think we're potentially missing a lot in the data. So uh, simulate data look great. Of course, these are empirical data. Um, so yeah, you see, uh, you know, not so surprising, right? You get this kind of theta and alpha, and then I guess this is, uh, yeah, maybe this is like, upper delta or low theta, this might be high theta or low alpha, yeah, I, I don't know, but, but you can you can decide for yourself. Also, these look like, uh, these are these are pretty clear um, artifacts here, right? These look like blink artifacts. This one's a bit higher frequency. Uh, it's it's significant, it's a significant cluster. And yeah, it's unclear, it, it certainly looks suspicious. You know, I would investigate this before interpreting that physiologically, but... Um, uh, but it, it could be some real prefrontal activity. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so the, the point is, um, yeah, this is a generalized agony composition is this really powerful framework that seems to have um, uh, powerful uh, applications for, for discovery in, in, in data and, um, and yeah, finding patterns in data that would be difficult to find just from looking at the, the channel level data. Okay, so I'll just try to summarize the, the whole talk. So midfrontal theta we see is a 
very idiosyncratic signature of, of near misses in cognitive control, although it does seem like it, the story is much more complicated than what we used to think uh, a decade ago. Um, I still have uh, no idea where uh, midfrontal theta is coming from, but uh, we're getting a little bit closer. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, it's, uh, I'm fairly optimistic because um, a lot of these questions that were sort of just totally speculative, you know, 10 or 15 years ago are now becoming answerable with, with new um, innovations in neuroscience technology. One thing I learned as a, as a, a, a human uh, is that starting a systems neuroscience lab is really fucking hard. It takes a really long time. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's just harder than I, and more time consuming than I thought it would be. But yeah, like I said before, if science were easy, it, it wouldn't be worth doing. Um, and then um, I also think that um, as we are getting more and more data uh, in, in neuroscience, we need to be thinking more and more carefully about what are the physiologically inspired and, and appropriate methods for analyzing those data and for treating those data and not just um, you know, doing the easy data analysis methods that people were doing 25 years ago. Um, Oh yeah, I, I did have uh, one one more slide here, or two more slides. So yeah, if you're interested in the code for running these analyses, you can check out my um, GitHub page, or sometimes it's on um, on uh, supplemental uh, material in um, uh, in the papers themselves. Uh, I, it turns out I do not have a Twitter account. There's there's 19 people in the world who think that this is my Twitter account, but this is just some junk, you know, got some some bot that sent one tweet in 2013. And uh, actually a couple of years ago, I, I contacted Twitter and I said, you know, give me this guy's handle because this is clearly not a thing. And they wrote back and said, no, you, you know, you're not a famous politician. So we're not gonna, we don't care about you. So um, yeah, so you, you might know me from my uh, textbook. Uh, this one I think is the, the one that's um, most widely used. You can get it on Amazon amongst other places. And I would like to take a, a moment to do some shameless self-promotion. I just published a linear algebra textbook, literally just this week. It just came out on Amazon this week. Um, so uh, yeah, it's like diagrams and, and you know, words and mathy stuff and exercises and code. It comes with Python and, and MATLAB code. So uh, I'm pretty excited about it. It's like uh, quite, a, quite a long time to work on this book. So if you're interested, you can, you can go check it out. So then here's the, um, the slide where, you know, I get to, uh, I have to admit that uh, uh, one of the great things about being a PI is I get to take credit for a lot of other people's hard work. So this is a slide that shows um, my uh, team actually, some, some, not all these people are, are still currently in the lab. A few have uh, graduated and, and gone on to better things, but I have and have had a, a really great team of postdocs and PhD students and uh, lots of master's students um, who are not pictured here and a technician. And these are the, the primary sources of funding over the past couple of years. So thanks again for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to continue with uh, some discussion if you guys have questions or comments. Let's see, uh, shall I stop sharing my screen? Seems appropriate. I, it depends. Uh, maybe there are uh, there are questions that refer to the slides, but then you can you can start it again. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a very very interesting talk. Fascinating. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of questions. I have already seen one question in the chat um, by David um, Chorcelier. I don't know uh, how to pronounce it properly. I'm sorry. Um, and that question is: Is temporal filtering equivalent to wavelet transformation? Yeah, exactly. So let me, uh, I'll, I guess I will keep my screen shared. Yeah, so um, in my mind, basically spatial filtering and temporal filtering are exactly the same. Um, so uh, with temporal filtering, you're taking a weighted combination of time points. And with spatial filtering, you're taking a weighted combination of channels uh, or electrodes or voxels or neurons. But it's always the same thing. It's always a linear weighted combination. 
So wavelet convolution is uh, is 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 really just that. It's you know you just uh, you have um, the weights are defined to maximize one particular narrow band in the spectrum. Wonderful. So are there any other questions? If there's no question at the moment, I'd like to come back to your um, comparison of the generalized eigenvector decomposition of the ICA, which um, is of special interest to our lab. And I have to admit, I'm one of the 15 people that think you're Mike X Cohn on Twitter, I, I fear. <laughs> so sorry for announcing that incorrectly. Um, so can you can you um, get a little bit deeper into, into this comparison um, and why you think this is the case for ICA? First of all, what kind of ICA did you use? And then um, what do you think is the reason why ICA would be so so much worse in case of um, no signal to noise ratio. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, it's something I, I've I've thought about, but I, I haven't really gone through it enough to be confident. So, one thing to keep in mind is that um, these different spatial filtering methods have different goals and different optimization criteria. So they're looking for different things in the data. Um. ICA is essentially, you know, it, it's based on the, the central limit theorem, which says that, um, you know, if you take a bunch of random things in the universe and you mix them together, that mixture is going to be Gaussian. Um, so therefore, ICA is going to try to find weighted combinations of channels that, that minimize the Gaussianness of their distributions. So that works really, you know, amazingly well for signals that really are non-Gaussian distributed. On the other hand, generalized eigenvalue composition is looking for um, a, a multivariate ratio of covariance matrices, and covariances are are basically a characteristic of Gaussian, right? They're, it's just based on variances, which is the just the second uh, moment of a distribution, <clears throat> and then. Um, it, it would unfortunately take me uh, too long to find the slides, but it, but I'd be happy to to show you what I, what I'm talking about some other time. But essentially, if you take a um, uh, if you take a narrow band signal, so if you look at the histogram of a pure sine wave, that histogram is like an inverted U, right? Because you have most of the data points are like minus one or n plus one. But then if you take um, like a Gaussian in the frequency domain, which is, you know, not an unreasonable model of brain oscillations, right? There's some non-stationarities, there's some wiggle, uh, but, you know, it's sort of roughly constrained within some band. And then you go back into the time domain and you look at the distribution. Those look pretty Gaussian. So what I think is happening is that the brain oscillations are roughly Gaussian distributed. Um, and that's why ICA looks at them and says, no, 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 this is bad, right? We don't want this, we want to suppress it. Um, I, I think that's what's happening in uh, the simulated data. Uh, now, it, it, how much that works in, in, in real data is more difficult to say because, I, I mean, I do find, uh, so in my hands, generalized eigen decomposition gives nicer, cleaner, more interpretable results than ICA. Uh, but, you know, it, it's hard to know if, if, if you know, the, the process that I just described, which I know it, I'm pretty sure it's happening in the simulated data. If that's also happening in the real data, that's, that's a bit harder to say. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So that basically then is um, boiling down to the assumption that you put in the model. Um, just one last question regarding that um, generalized eigenvector decomposition. Is there like, for, for lazy people like like me, is there like a toolbox out there that can be used easily straightforward in MATLAB or Python? Um, yeah, it's, uh, 
Uh, well, I have a, a bunch of code uh, that you can use. I, I don't have like a sort of clickable toolbox. So it's it's actually, it's pretty easy. So running this is is one equation, uh, one line of code. Um, and then of course, you know, you need more than one line of code to set everything up to be able to run one line of code. Um, but it's um, it's not so hard. So basically you, you have to select data for the, the two covariance matrices. And then you do the eigen decomposition, and then you you multiply the data by you know the the first eigenvector here. Um, so you know I'm, I'm always happy to uh, to like help out uh, um, anyone who's interested in, in applying these analyses. It's it's not that hard. The hardest part actually of the whole thing, the whole procedure, the hardest part is knowing what data to select, what data features to put into the this covariance matrix and into this covariance matrix. Otherwise, it's not so hard. Um, MATLAB does it uh, trivially. Python, it's it's a little bit, um, you know, I mean, I say trivially, but but this is like really difficult, um, advanced neural computation stuff. So MATLAB just has more has has more accurate libraries. Python has a harder time doing this. Fortunately, you can use SciPy's um, IG H. Uh, Function which makes a couple of additional assumptions, but if yeah, if if possible, I, I would recommend doing this in in MATLAB. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. So, yeah. just one last question. There, there are uh, other questions already uh, piling up there. But coming back to the question of the um, basically, as I understand you correctly, you you, you select a comparison like a baseline resting period, and that you then compare to an experimental period, right? and uh, exactly. you just you just said that. Um, picking R is like the most crucial, one of the crucial aspects here because that will determine the maximum difference between the two conditions. So yeah. what do you usually pick then for R? Yeah, so for this uh, frequency stuff, what I do is um, take R, uh, let me show from these data. Um, so, so for spectral scanning, uh, we take R to be the covariance of the broadband signal. So this is non-temporally filtered, um, or you know, some it might be like high pass at one hertz and maybe low pass at, at, at 50 or 60 or something like that. But generally a uh, broadband signal. And then the S would be the covariance matrix from a narrowband filtered signal. And what's nice about that approach is the, the two data sets, actually the two covariance matrices come from exactly the same time windows. So that means that all of the cognitive factors, all the motor perceptual sensory factors, those are all held constant. Those are all equally present in both of these matrices, which is nice because then the eigen decomposition is gonna suppress uh, whatever is common between those. And it's only going to highlight whatever is, is unique to S that separates S from R. And that's gonna be whatever is the, in this case, the theta um, uh, features. Okay, great. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I have also some follow-up questions, but I'm going to stand back for now. Um, and uh, I'm going to read out the next question by Juan. And he asks, uh, any guess about what the other thetas may be doing in the brain? Uh, Juan, I was hoping you could tell me. <laughs> Me? Us? We? <laughs> <laughs> Juan? Yeah, or any one of you. Uh, no, I, I don't know. So we look at these other thetas. Um, so some of them are like occipital parietal thetas, uh, which you see, for example, whenever you, you flash a stream, it's basically the, the ERP, the visual ERP, um, has energy in theta. So part of that is there. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's also some, some artifacts related to the eyes uh, that we see in theta as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, with, you know, we, we have 330 or whatever sensors, so 330 dimensional space. So we, and, you know, we're, and so yeah, we, we get a lot, a lot of uh, components. I think, you know, one of the, uh, I don't know, what's the right word, devastating, maybe eye-opening things about um, taking a multivariate approach to these kinds of uh, data is, you realize how much stuff is going on um, 
in the brain in the recordings that that we basically just ignore. And to some extent, you know, that's fine. We're ignoring it because it's not necessarily relevant. All these components are statistically significant, but they are not necessarily uh, meaningful in the sense of being related to the task. That was, you know, the difference between, you know, this 20 components here, and I don't know which subject this was, but, you know, the, the difference between like 20 and three. So, uh, yeah, so it, it's a good question, but uh, I, I don't really know. Shall I read the, the next questions? Yeah, feel free to do so, of course. Yeah, so then a question from Renee about rats not being a very good model. So that's <clears throat> uh, also a slightly contentious uh, thing to say in, uh, in, in modern neuroscience. But I guess, you know, it's not only my feeling from, my, uh, from our data, but also when I see um, publications and, and talks where, where people are trying to link um, <clears throat> rodent findings to human findings, and in particular, frontal data. I just see that, um, you know, they don't look similar. Basically, you look at the side-by-side -side at the time frequency plots of the rodent data and the time frequency plots of the human data. And some of these, you know, authors in some of these papers will argue that these are comparable but I, I don't see it. I, I just, I think it's, they're just, they just look too different to me. And, you know, maybe with one or two papers, you know, it can always be something weird, but you, uh, I see this now consistently across many groups and in my own data. And um, yeah, I, I know we're, we're all kind of supposed to believe that, that rodents are, are good models for studying human brain. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that certainly is true in some cases, but I, I'm just not, convinced that um, that's trivially true in for all kinds of um, systems in the brain. Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit of a vague answer, but uh, it's, it's a bit of a feeling. Yeah. So Stefan asks, um, has the test for uh, significance <coughs> uh, work? Yeah, so um, so so the test for statistical significance is based on permutation testing. And um, it's actually a pretty straightforward thing because um, the you know if the uh, so I don't have really the the math on uh, in in the slides in this talk, but the the math basically works out to be um, w where w is is one eigenvector, so w s w divided by w r w and that equals lambda, which is this um, eigenvalue. So if s and r are identical then that ratio is going to be one. So the, the um, lambda value is one. And uh, of course, you know, with, with sampling variability and, you know, noise and so on, you wouldn't expect, even if the null hypothesis were true, you wouldn't expect this uh, lambda to be exactly one. Um, but so what we do, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, it is one covariance matrix, but this is actually a, the average of many covariance matrices. So we compute the covariance matrix for, um, every individual trial, and then we average all those covariance matrices together. So let's say, you know, there's like 100 trials, and then we have 200 covariance matrices. So in one iteration of permutation testing, we randomly assign each of the um, covariance matrices randomly to be averaged into S or R, and then we do the eigen decomposition again. And then, you know, of course, we repeat that lots and lots of times. Um, and then you keep doing like a meta permutation and you take the maximum possible eigenvalue, uh, which ends up being here. So these are probably, you know, this uh, part of the spectrum here, this is probably somewhere around one. So you see <coughs> uh, maybe the eigenvalue. Oh yeah, so here you see uh, these power ratios here. So the, the null hypothesis value is one. Um, and then the dotted line here would be basically the maximum eigenvalue that we get from resampling, uh, and yeah, it's it's almost that simple. You you do have to be mindful of some normalization factors and, and so on, but um, but I, I'm pretty sure we uh, uh, that yeah, I'm sure that code is is somewhere in some paper somewhere. Otherwise, you can email me, Stefan, and I'm I'd be happy to to direct you to it. Um, yeah, then uh, Julio asked, um, how do we decide the, the bandwidth of uh, the filter for the for theta? 
It is a good question. Um, and because also the, the peak frequency, and if I remember correctly, I have to admit so you know, the nice thing about being a PI is you get to take credit for other people's work, but the, the annoying part is you don't always remember all the details. Um, I, if I remember correctly, I believe what we did was a, um, uh, a time, so we look, we did a time frequency decomposition on channel FCZ for each individual, and then we found that person's peak um, theta frequency. Um, and then uh, we, we custom tailored this theta frequency uniquely for each person's peak theta frequency. But your question was about the bandwidth and uh, I, I don't remember. Yeah, but that said, I, I think as long as you're within a reasonable uh, range, it's not going to be so bad. You're, you're gonna get basically the same findings regardless of, uh, as long as it isn't intensely narrow or, or really, really wide. How will you ever be capable to come to any functionality of those files day? Uh, I won't. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, um, I, I, you know, I, I get uh, um, annoyed and, and to be honest, a little bit disparaged when I see these uh, stories in, in neuroscience that, you know, the brain is really simple. You know, it's just, it's this brain area does this thing or this neuron does this other thing. I, I don't know how the brain works, but uh, I, I do think that it's it's so unfathomably complicated that we don't really even understand how complicated it is. And so I, I think a lot of the, uh, the, the work that we're doing now um, can be basically summarized as saying, yeah, the brain is really fucking complicated. And the more we try to do um, detailed data analysis, the more uh, complicated it starts to look. And, you know, it's a fair criticism to say, yeah, but what does all that complexity mean? And uh, I, I don't know. That's where I get lazy and, you know, go out drinking and other people have to do that part. <laughs> Um, yeah, might I follow up? Uh, like um, on the very first slide, you basically um, um, you reminisce about which direction you wanted to go, um, looking at the yeah. front of the trans data. And one of the direction was like um, moving into like um, mobile, the real world, basically mm -hmm. outside the lab. And I think what you do actually is kind of a mixture of that, right? I mean, if you're looking in, into the rodent studies, they are more realistic in the sense that you have full body movement, right? So you already left restricted stationary setups in human lab settings, basically, mm -hmm. which if you if you look at the standard protocols require participants to, to remain seated, not move at all, you know, and you reduce the dimensionality of, of sensory input massively. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the vector space of all your different data activity networks there. So um, would you think that sensory, multidimensional sensory information due to movement and action in an environment might contribute to, you know, different networks, underlying potential different data vectors, for example, or um, like different kinds of data and different frequency peaks, for example? Yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, doing the, the rodent stuff is a little bit more um, uh, naturalistic. Um, which slide did I want? I went to this slide. So actually in, in this MEG study where, you know, where these data come from, these people were, you know, they, they had uh, 50 EEG channels and then they were laying on their back inside the MEG scanner. And they're, you know, so that's, it's not exactly a, a realistic um, sort of natural uh, real world behavior. And so we, we still do see, so, so this could be underrepresenting the complexity and the multidimensionality. Yeah, but I think in the real world, you know, there's gonna be other parts of this subspace that are related to, you know, coming from like modulations from uh, motivation and um, like emotional state or mood uh, you know, if you're like really hungry or if you're sort of sitting focused at your desk and being perfectionistic about, about work and you, you have, you make some mistake. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, 
I mean, I, I guess what you're saying is that the, or if I interpret correctly, what you're saying is that, you know, this dimensionality might not be fixed, but might itself be uh, modulated by the, the environment and, and the context and other sensory motor um, dynamics that are happening at the same time. Yeah. Even though what you show there already is like without having that kind of um, like action avail available in the experiment, you still have like a high dimensionality and differences between those subjects. So um, yeah, this might simply increase the number within the subspace even more if you now start moving in the real world. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely possible. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Just to comment very briefly on that, um, and it's not only the fact that we move and therefore neural oscillations are different, but just from a practical perspective, if you have a moving participant, there will be shifts in the electrodes and other things that mm. will also be difficult for, for, for an algorithm like this, uh, who, uh, which, which assumes stationary um, yep. patterns and so on. So this, this is what I'm currently dealing with in my experiment. I have very similar ICA patterns uh, even if I restrict the principal components to like a very low amount before. So I suspect that's because of electrode shift and these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an excellent point. So um, we were also concerned about, about that. So, you know, for example, it could be that these two components are really the same component, but halfway through the experiment, the subject moves their head like that, which won't change the EEG. Uh, but it will completely, or not completely, but you know, it will sort of significantly shift all the MEG sensors. So we, we did quite a bit of, um, of uh, analyses uh, to look into that, to see you know, how, how stationary these components are over time. Um, and it doesn't seem like we've, uh, that these are you know, um, uh, corrupted by any kind of uh, movement artifacts or, or anything like that. That said, you know, and one thing to keep in mind is that this is a, uh, a eigen decomposition is a, is a purely linear analysis. So it's a purely linear decomposition and linear separation. So it is possible that these, you know, that this, that these two is like one nonlinear dimension. You know, if you imagine like, you know, some little trajectory that's going around in a circle, it's actually, you know, from the, from the particles perspective, it's a one dimensional um, trajectory track. But from a linear perspective, we need two linear dimensions to account for that. But uh, so, so that's certainly possible. The, the thing is, yeah, like nonlinear dimension reduction is, is impossibly untrustworthy in noisy empirical data in, in high dimensions. So, uh, so yeah, so, so I, I can't really, we can't really say much about that. But um, but but if you check out the the paper, we do go through quite a few analyses to to show that um, these really are separable and stable throughout the entire experiment period. Wonderful. If you don't mind, I have one more question about the generalized eigen decomposition. Yeah. Um, in. Uh, in your slides, you mentioned, or uh, I saw a comparison also not only with uh, ICA, but also with uh, joint diagonalization and mm -hmm. with SSD. Yeah. And given the fact that you are also filtering uh, narrow bandwidth and comparing that with a large bandwidth, how is, that, uh, how is uh, the GED approach different from SSD and JD in this case? Yeah, great question. So basically all three of these methods on the, the left-hand column here, these are all the same. These are all uh, generalized eigen decomposition. Just joint special cases of each other. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, these are, you know, like this generalized eigen decomposition is a, is, a, is a formula that provides a solution to what's called the, the rally quotient. And that's it's used in lots of different applications. So the difference between these different methods, so this is, you know, um, narrow band versus broadband. Uh, Joint decorrelation is based on uh, uh, like, yeah, sort of um, correlating with a, a pure sine wave as a template. And the SSD is based on yeah, different, um, just different temporal filters where you're focusing just on the, um, the flanking frequencies on the entire spectrum. 
But otherwise, yeah, I, I would say that these are basically the differences between these methods is like just, you know, it's it's just some 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 window dressing basically. So the main difference between these three and ICA is that for ICA, ICA is blind and you don't you don't need uh, any prior knowledge or, or assumptions per se. I mean, you, you, it comes with a lot of assumptions by itself, but, um, but for your approach and for the other two, you kind of need to decide before what is the frequency or, uh, or the, the spatial distribution that you're looking for, basically. Uh, uh, kind of, yeah. Um, so it's or certainly sure that these, the, these, are, these, uh, these two methods are purely blind, right? These are like guided, these are partially blind. So you do have to specify um, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. So like here, for example, the null hypothesis is um, uh, the broadband signal and the alternative hypothesis is narrowband signal. Uh, and, and same like with SSD, you know, the null hypothesis is the flanking bands. Um, so yeah, so that's true. That's that's why I, I mentioned uh, before for with Klaus's question that I think the hardest part of GED is is figuring out what features you want to um, uh, show. Yeah, what what features you want to highlight? Yeah, so I see uh, more comments like endless piles of data. Yeah, it's all true. Um, I have lots of data, so you know if people are uh, have have time, uh, we're already starting to share some of our data, and we have more data that will be shared in the next couple of years. Yeah, which is great and also takes a lot of time <laughs> preparing yeah, exactly, the data yeah. and the code to be shared. Yeah, it's like it's like half of the paper itself. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's also true. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to comment about um, reanalyzing published data, which oh sounds, that too, yeah, sounds you know great in theory. Like yeah, we should do it, but it it's a, it's also a huge commitment. It's not something you can just uh, you can just do. Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, thinking that there should be some requirement uh, for new PhD students by law to do some um, just some um, reproduction or reanalyzation mm. of prior data, and it should be like um, highly regarded to do that. Right yeah. in the moment, yeah. it's like something that you wouldn't actually do. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's another uh, question about. So it's quite a, quite a lot of comments. So thank you to everyone for. Um, Coming. So, so a couple of people are commenting on sort of the complexity and one person saying lack of behavioral side. So embedded in this in this story is is more data that I'm selectively not talking about, like here in, in this particular task. Um, but I think it's also, uh, you know, and I appreciate that um, the contextualizing brain activity with behavior is, uh, is it helps interpret uh, the brain. But I, I don't think we will ever understand how the brain works just by measuring behavior and, and constraining everything to link to behavior. I think it also depends on what you define as behavior. You know, so I, you know, I can sort of grasp my, I can squeeze my, my fists like this, and that is a behavior. Uh, but right now my brain is doing, you know, trillions of computations and all sorts of like uh, molecular, cellular, synaptic, circuit and systems level things. And I think those are all behaviors. Everything that your brain manifests that we can measure is a behavior. Uh, and, and to say that, you know, it has to be um, interpreted in the context of what the body is doing, I, I think is... Um, it's a bit of a, a sort of Skinnerian approach, you know, where you say that uh, you know things are only meaningful if if it, it results in some like large scale body movement that we can measure. So it's not um, yeah not to discredit your question, but um, I, I do think that um, I, yeah I think uh, we we won't understand the brain if we say that every neuroscience finding has to be related to behavior or correlated to behavior. Yeah. 
and plenty of people disagree with me, by the way. So it's just my opinion. <laughs> no, I, I think that might be a continuum, right? But I think um, I, I entirely agree that might be, um, obviously there are metacognitive processes that do not require any kind of physical output. Yeah. Um, but I, um, that's coming back to the vector well, the sub space basically of the theta, for example, that I, um, I would consider a different behavioral state to potentially impact brain dynamic states massively. Right? Um, so I, th I think that might be the perspective um, um, that this question is coming from. Yeah, I guess I, I can say, so there's a, a slide that I didn't show here, which is um, looking at these things called uh, partial errors, which we used to do a lot, where we measure EMG uh, from the, the, the thumbs that people are using to press the button. So. Here you see EMG for the correct response, and then here's the mechanical button press. Um, and then here we see uh, quite a number of these trials where the subjects um, started moving the, the, the thumb of the incorrect hand. So this is a partial error. Uh, and then somehow, you know, they, they managed to realize that uh, so their brain figured out that it was the incorrect um, error, and they managed to stop that to suppress that behavior and then activate the real behavior. So this is also a correct trial. And if you're not measuring EMG, you would never know that these trials existed. So this was like one of my initial questions. So that where you had like the 40 papers to, to show that this theta response that you were showing in the beginning, this is related to this EMG. So you basically time log the, okay. That explains yeah. it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Very yeah, in, in yeah, fact, Sorry. Yeah, in fact, um, this uh, looking at these partial errors, this is the the like the the cleanest and best and and most and purest way we've we've found to like maximize this conflict signal. Um, so yeah, it's about like you know ten to fifteen percent on average of uh, trials, correct trials, contain these partial errors, which increases with longer RTs. And this is, yeah, there's so much fascinating uh, data in here, like correlating the um, EEG dynamics with the correction time, you know, this, this lag time here. And uh, that part was published uh, in, in this paper, it was in NeuroImage. And, you know, it, what also didn't get published was a bunch of other analyses that we started doing but never had time to finish, which is like, you know, looking at, for example, the, the, the ratio of energy in, the, in the, corrected re the correct response versus the partial error and seeing how that relates to conflict data. So there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's so much um, in these data, so many possibilities. And at the end of the day, you know, we only have so many hours in a day. So we, we have to be, unfortunately, a little bit selective about what we can focus on and, and publish, but um, yeah. So it really is uh, endless piles of data. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very briefly, when, when I first saw right, these plots, I thought that this would be EEG, and I was very envious <laughs> about the oh, right. cleanliness of the data. <laughs> no, if you told me this is EEG, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like, this is wow. some artifact, yeah. 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 That was EMG, yeah. yeah, from the thumb. All right. So I think we've come to the end of the questions so far. So um, if there are any more questions, feel free to ask them right now. Otherwise, it's also uh, quite nice timing. And, uh, and I would like to thank you all again for participating, for being there as an audience. And of course, you, Mike, for giving the talk. This was absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure I will follow up with lots of uh, questions for uh, for the eigenvalue decomposition and so on because yeah please do um, yeah I'm I'm currently developing a pipeline and one of the pipeline aspects is um, more than ICA as an as a spectral uh, as a spatial uh, decomposition right and there are plenty of things I need still need to learn and this is very interesting yeah great yeah thanks again for inviting me. Uh, I enjoyed it. And thanks everyone for coming. I'm sorry we can't all meet in person and go out for, for drinks afterwards, but this is uh, better than nothing. Starting no, but it's a great opportunity, actually, because before Corona, we didn't have these kind of talks and also not. Oh, right. I so see. It's I really see. nice, yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.